You can find my new book, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds. Thank you to everyone who made that book a number one national bestseller. Really appreciate those of you who went out and got it. If you haven't already, go get the book because we're seeing it play out in real time as our own government and governments around the world are clamping down on our rights, on our traditional way of life. Nowhere is this clearer than in Australia, where Australian police are shooting rubber bullets at people who are protesting their truly draconian lockdown policies, stay-at-home orders, uh, utopian demands, impossible demands to get to, quote, COVID zero. To help me make sense of this, I'm joined by Satya Marar, a Sydney and Washington, D.C.-based policy writer, foreign trained legal professional, who has written extensively on uh, civil liberties, among other things, for the U.S. and international media, and has provided a lot of uh, insight into what's going on in Australia. Satya, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. So my question, very technical, erudite question, what the hell is going on in Australia? Uh, look, uh, Sydney and Melbourne, amongst other areas of the country, have been plunged into a long-standing lockdown where basic civil liberties have been taken away. Uh, people can only travel a few uh, miles away from the house for exercise and for a limited range of purposes, including essential shopping. Um, and, you know, finally, at long last, there is a plan to uh, start opening things up for the vaccinated by October and then, uh, you know, further easing of restrictions by December. Unfortunately, the problem is in the process of going this far, we've seen horrible precedents set uh, for against you know the violation of basic civil liberties, including the right to protest against uh, government tyranny. Um, and we've seen uh, bills passed that would grant surveillance powers that are unprecedented uh, to our police officers, including uh, taking over social media accounts uh, using a form of uh, a warrant, which doesn't even need approval from the judiciary. Uh, so uh, really, it's what we're seeing is absolutely terrible. And we've seen thousands of people flood the streets of Melbourne to protest, not just against lockdowns, but against uh, vaccination mandates for people in the construction sector. Um, you know, people are rightly upset because many people are going to be pushed out of their work. I happen, you know, I got vaccinated myself. You know, I've got uh, no issue with that. I encourage other people to do so. Uh, but there's also a civil liberties issue around whether a government should be coercing people out of a job um, in, in, or their livelihood on that basis. Uh, so it really is concerning. I, I want to hit on something you just mentioned there, which is about the construction workers. I saw a video that was put out by Rebel News where cops would, are just approaching construction workers, harassing them, arresting them, uh, profiling them as people who are among the unwashed masses, the unvaxxed, unwashed masses. And it, it highlights, uh, I think, an underreported aspect of the lockdown measures, which is that the the primary divisions we're seeing here are not racial. They're not sexual. They're not even really geographic. They're class. This is the ruling class going in and harassing tradesmen. And here in the United States, we call them deplorables and irredeemables, you know, bitter clinging Bible thumping rubes. Uh, This is a a class conflict between the, the ruling government that appears more and more oligarchic every day and the, the preponderance, I think, of the people. Yeah, absolutely. There's a huge aspect of that. Uh, There's even a divide in terms of ethnic communities, too. You know, in Sydney, it was mainly the areas outside of the cities, you know, the the ethnic communities, the outer west, more working class, more salt of the earth, who are affected by even stricter lockdowns and even stricter policing uh, when, uh, you know, lockdowns went into full effect. Uh, But what's interesting is that even the traditional groups that have stood up for the working class, including unions, who have historically always been very pro the right to protest, uh, very pro the right to stand up to the government or uh, to, you know, uh, even corporations uh, are coming out condemning these protesters, not just, you know, advising them against protesting, but branding them all as being far right extremists for protesting on really a civil liberties issue, which is the right to make a personal choice about your own health. So it's absolutely bizarre and, and very strange. Meanwhile, you've got, uh, you know, a lot of, I would say, uh, corporate elitists, uh, you know, people have got white collar jobs, that sort of a thing, who aren't as badly affected. You know, they can work at home, they can be on a Zoom call and so on. Um, they might not really understand how bad it is for some people. Uh, but really, it's been disgusting to see this. Uh, there was a protester, well, he was, he was just standing and talking to a police officer. Video footage shows he was tackled and smashed to the ground. He was just standing there. They've used rubber bullets, uh, rubber bullets. they've used tear gas. Uh, an, uh, an old lady with an Australian flag cape, there's video footage of her, she was tackled to the ground and two cops, because, you know, you need two of them, obviously, because that's such a threat. Pepper spraying her right in the face while she's lying on the ground. And, and you know, the 
There's people who have the guile to say that the protesters are acting like fascists. I mean, come on, give me a break. Uh, of course. It, it's funny you mentioned that the, the smear, that they're all right, far right-wing fascist extremists. The head of BLM in New York City is now leading a protest against the vaccination mandates. And uh, it might be the only thing that I have in common with BLM in New York City, other than that I guess we're both New Yorkers. Uh, I, I don't agree with these people on just about anything. They are far left, as far left as they come. But there are a lot of radical leftists. There are a lot of conservatives. And there are a lot of politically not all that interested people in the middle who say, I do not want the Dr. Fauci's of the world and the public health bureaucrats of the world uh, taking away my civil liberties, taking away my traditional way of life and locking me up in my home for months and months at a time. You, you mentioned that n- now there's a light at the end of the tunnel in Australia, but I, I think the question that a lot of people are asking is, can we really believe that? We were told 15 days to slow the spread. That was 580 days ago. So wh- what is to stop these authorities from s- opening up a little bit in December and then locking down again in January? Well, nothing really. They've shifted the goalposts multiple times. Uh, but you also touched on a very important aspect, which is that this really isn't a left or a right issue. Uh, in fact, you know, conservatives, I think, have been guilty in the past, perhaps, uh, you know, when we had BLM protests in Australia last year, a lot of conservatives came out saying, how dare these guys do that? There's a pandemic happening. Now we can see that the shoe's on the other foot and it's come back to haunt our conservatives. Um, and, and, you know, the same laws that are now being used uh, to tackle many of these uh, anti-lockdown protesters are the ones that were being used against anti-mining protesters, anti-war protesters. You know, civil liberties really mean something. I think the American founding fathers understood this very well. Unfortunately, on there. In fact, one of our courts ruled, uh, you know, recently with regard to the restrictions on international and interstate travel, they ruled that uh, the Biosecurity Act actually gives the government the power to explicitly override fundamental human rights. Uh, you know, so much for a liberal democracy. Unfortunately, that's the road we're going down. And I hope that America doesn't pursue the same path. You know, when we saw this here in the United States last year, uh, I think a lot of what people were focusing on with those BLM riots, and in many cases, they were just out, out and out riots, looting, arson, murder, burning down police stations, is they said, wait a second, you've locked all of us out of our churches and our businesses for months and months. But now in, here in the United States, p- the public health authorities were encouraging the BLM people in many cases to go out and write. They, there, there was a group of about 1,200 so-called experts who said that uh, BLM protests were actually helping the public health because white supremacy is a lethal condition that predates and contributes to COVID-19. I'm not joking. And so a lot of conservatives looked and they said, look at this rank hypocrisy. But more and more, I'm beginning to think it isn't hypocrisy. It's a hierarchy. It's that certain classes of people get special privileges. They can go to the Metropolitan Gala without masks on. They can go uh, dancing in San Francisco nightclubs like the mayor of San Francisco in violation of their own mask mandates, in violation of their own public health rules. And who are the people who have to pay the bill and actually go along with it? It's the construction workers in Australia. Yeah, uh, look, I mean, you see this issue in Australia as well with the narrative framing around the way different media outlets report on different protests. And it's, it's very blatantly obvious. I think most people are clued into it, which is a good thing. You know, we should be skeptical of these uh, institutions. Um, what's, uh, what's interesting, though, is, uh, you know, I actually had a chance to see the BLM protest last year. I lived in D.C. And, you know, up until about 9 or 10 p.m., you know, near Lafayette Park in Washington, D.C., it was actually peaceful. Yeah. Thousands of people, lots of kids. It was a sort of almost a carnival atmosphere. And then at a certain point in time, some troublemakers came in and there was, I, I actually saw a CVS get looted. I saw a car catch fire. Um, I think the important thing to note is, you know, there are probably going to be disruptive people at a lot of protests, including possibly these lockdown protests, because they're opportunists. That's what they are. Uh, that's not an excuse to use horrible police tactics on people who are, in fact, being peaceful. Uh, and it is also not an excuse to use uh, draconian laws, facial surveillance technology and so on against people who just happen to be standing around who are there exercising their democratic freedom of expression, uh, who are not actually being violent. Uh, And I think this is something that we all need to keep in mind because there's a real danger now because of this whole idea that we're trading away our our liberty. So for the sake of feeling a little bit safer, once you give up your liberty, it's gone for good. We can't have that happen. You know, I think people don't fully appreciate, they're, they're aware of it vaguely, but they don't fully appreciate just how intense 
the surveillance regime has gotten. I, I was reminded of this just the other day. I was flying back in from overseas and I, I have a global entry card. So you just go up to a machine and at least the last time I did it, you scan a passport and you type in information. And But now the surveillance has gotten so good, you just sort of show your face to a camera. They print out all of your information. They just recognize a facial recognition software. It's not just the government that has that. It's the biggest corporations in the world, the people that we work with every single day on our phones and our computers, they, they have an extraordinary asymmetry of information and power. And they, they are threatening to use that, and they are using that in many ways. And so I, I think a lot of the revolt against this ruling class, yes, it has to do with the narrow issue of the coronavirus, but it, it really is much, much broader than that. And you're seeing that start to bubble up now. So my question for you is, you're an expert on uh, civil liberties. How do we get them back? Uh, well, it's 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 a tough uh, it's a tough struggle to be honest. Uh, even in a place like the U.S., where there are pretty strong, relatively strong constitutional protections against many of these things, uh, there is the Fourteenth Amendment, for example, about uh, surveillance. Um, even there, you have to be willing to take these laws to court, uh, and often there'll be pr- presidents ruling by executive order, passing things that they know are unconstitutional, but they know that it'll be a good few months for anyone puts the resources together and tries to get that overruled. Uh, Australia, unfortunately, faces an even steeper uphill battle. Uh, And we've seen this happen. I mentioned before that the warrants can be approved by non-judiciary members. You know, we have our administrative appeals tribunal. That's an executive body. Often the appointments are made, uh, you know, have been accused, they've been accused of doing political cronyism with the way they have appointments. A lot of their rulings are, in fact, Uh, pro-government. And I think all you can really do is start to have a deeper respect for the reason why we have these institutions. The problem is, in the past, we've seen a lot of people from all walks of life, rich and poor, come together to support increased surveillance, the name of combating, for example, terrorism or something like that, that we can all agree is objectively horrific. Unfortunately, those laws will be turned on innocent people too. Um, and it, it's, it's, unfortunately, it is an uphill battle, but there are lawyers fighting these cases and I wish them the best of luck and they deserve all the support that they can get. Yeah, uh, yes, I, I think that's right. You know, you, you had a bit of a slip there, which is you, you referenced the 14th Amendment when you were referring to the, the Fourth Amendment against unreasonable search and seizure. Yes. But I think it was, a, it was a fortunate slip, a fortuitous slip, because the 14th Amendment give, is supposed to give us equal protection under the law. And what we are seeing here is it's not exactly equal protection under the law. You're, you're seeing certain classes of people treated differently by the government. And speaking of our surveillance state, you're seeing different classes of people being treated differently by the big tech companies who control our public square. Facebook, there was just a bombshell report showed that Facebook only enforces its, its standards rules on certain people. Other people get a free pass. You know, it, All the animals are equal, but some are more equal than others, it would appear. And, and we're seeing that play out in real time. I think it's, it's important to remember, too, what you say. When you lose these kinds of liberties, they don't, they don't come back. You know, when, when so much of this COVID tyranny has been uh, a power grab. And when people take power, they don't like to give it up. It's why I'm not particularly surprised that we're in the 580th some odd day of of the 15 days to slow the spread. That's how these things work. (laughs) When you take power, you don't necessarily give them back. Uh, You know, we've just got about 30 or 40 seconds left. Uh, if, If you pulled out your crystal ball, do you have hope for the situation in Australia? Or are you the conservative optimist who says, the things are very certainly going to get much, much worse. <laughs> Look, I've got, uh, you know, I've become very much a very cynical person when it comes to the government, when it comes to surveillance state. I do hope the pendulum swings back. But who I do have faith in, who I do have hope in are the Australian people. Uh, we've been through a very tough time. People have been very resilient. People have been willing to give up a lot on the individual level for their fellow human being. That naturally doesn't justify the kind of horrible lockdowns that we've seen. Uh, but I do think that this whole experience will hopefully make more people wiser as to why liberties are in fact important, and in doing so, hopefully pull together people from the left and the right. If there's one strength that Australia has that perhaps America could maybe America could maybe learn a little bit from, uh, it would be uh, you know sometimes it's good to find areas you can agree on with your opponents. And we're seeing polarization creep into Australia. I, you know, I would say American style polarization. I really hope that doesn't keep happening, but let's find out. I agree. I totally agree. See, we're finding common ground. I'm agreeing with someone who knows quite a lot about Australia and has a very a uh, very fun accent as well. Uh, <laughs> this is, we'll find it with our, our friends with the accents down under, all over, different differing views 